Hello, it's Roger Bisbee here from Skill Builder, and we've got Ask Skill Builder, another episode. We've got loads of questions coming in, so I'm gonna get straight on with it. Thank you very much for sending those in. Keep them coming because we love it. Question here from David Kilvington, and he's sent us a little video. So let's have a look at this. So, hi, here's my uh, boiler installation, new ATAG boiler. So the problem is, so if I flush the toilet, uh, the boiler will come on when it shuts off. So it's just filling up now. Actually, I've heard those ATAG, I've heard some good reports of those, the ATAG boilers. They're, um, they're pretty efficient. They, they seem to give you quite a lot of things that other boilers give you as an extra. So there's a lot built in there. So they also do a long warranty, seven years, I think it is. So maybe even extendable to 10. So that's a pretty good thing. I mean, Worcester Bosch are doing that, but there aren't that many boiler manufacturers who are that confident. It looks like, it, I mean, the thing's working well, so it's just working too much. What I would try here, I was gonna say put a non-return valve into the water supply into the boiler, but the only trouble with that is that when you get that expanded bit of water that's in the hot water pipe, it needs somewhere to go. So then you would probably need to put in something like a, a small pressure vessel. And I'm only talking about a little one that would allow that expansion to take place. And, and you talk about a water hammer or arrester, and that would be the kind of thing I would be talking about. Put a small pressure vessel on the supply pipe coming into the boiler, the cold water supply, and see if that helps. But but what's happening here, when you've been using something else, in like your loo, you flush the loo, as you showed there in the video, the water pressure on the boiler is backing off because it's filling up the loo. And then once the loo's filled up, that water pressure comes back as a bit of a surge and it pushes the diverter valve over in the boiler because the boiler thinks it's calling for, for water somewhere, hot water somewhere. So it's tricking the boiler into thinking that it's got a demand situation. It's not actually doing any harm there. All it does is gives you a tiny little bit of preheat on the hot water. So I think I would try, first of all, I would try a little pressure vessel and see if that helps. And if it doesn't, then a non-return valve would be my next option. But as I say, you need somewhere for that hot water to expand. And what sometimes happens, I've seen this in the past, is that when that hot water, when you turn the hot tap off, the combi boiler's got so much heat still in there that it increases the pressure on the on the water. And I have seen troubles with ceramic disc taps where the pressure's been so great that it's caused a damage to the, the, the tap. So one of those two will solve the problem. It's not really the boiler as such that's causing the problem, but um, the plumbing system and just the way it's set up. Maybe if you haven't got that flow rate high enough in the house, turn up the flow rate. You've had a new cold water pipe put in there. So turn that stopcock to fully open and then maybe turn down the inlet valve on the WC so that it controls that. So that's a bit of a slower fill. And if you do that, you may find that the pressure on the boiler is maintained. It might just be a little bit of fine tuning you've got to do. And Lee is having an extension built. He sent us a nice little drawing here showing what he's having done now. He's gone the right way about this. He's had the drawings done, he's had the architect on board, and now the architect is saying, well, I'm gonna manage the job, I'll manage the job for you. And he wants a percentage of the contract value to manage the job. Now, what this basically means, he's gonna look after everything that the builder's doing. But in order to do that, he wants the builder to sign a contract. And they found that a lot of builders have come along and they said that, that it's a bit of a mystery to them that they were all pricing this job so high that they would lose it. And they finally found a builder that's willing to do it for the kind of money the architect said that it would cost. Now, that's a great, you know, they're in Newcastle. So you're assuming, okay, Newcastle, 
it's not the most expensive part of the country to have building work done and you'd assume that there were people up there who wanted the work so what are they finding these builders when they go along what are they picking up what vibes are they picking up that they don't like maybe they're thinking oh this customer's a bit demanding this customer doesn't trust us this isn't going to be a pleasant experience for us. Maybe they're thinking that. I don't know. I'm not saying anything goes you, Lee, but, but it's that kind of feeling that... I know that feeling. When you go into a house and you think, oh, this is going to be difficult because already I've only just sat down and they're already getting contracts out and they want me to sign this, sign that, sign some kind of penalty clause. And if you're a builder, you're sort of a happy-go-lucky, friendly kind of guy who works on a fairly casual basis you know what you're doing. You may not want to tie yourself into that kind of very strict contract that looks like it's going to cause problems for you. So it's really a question of finding somebody you can trust. You've got two choices here. You either go with the architect and then you've got to find another builder who is willing to sign on the dotted line and they are probably going to charge you more money. So you end up paying the architect, you end up paying the builder a premium because he's being controlled by the architect and a lot of builders including me don't like that because a lot of my experiences with architects have not been good you know they've been a little bit exacting they want you to do something a certain way which actually you don't agree with um, I had one architect for instance who insisted on all the walls being plastered indoors with sand and cement rather than anything else now these were thermalite blocks and I thought that was absolutely unnecessary and the wrong way to go because the thermalite blocks, they're fairly weak. And if you put a strong sand and cement on there, and he even specified the mix that he wanted on there, um, the whole thing would shrink and crack the blocks, which is exactly what happened. Six weeks later, there's cracks appearing all over the place. Did the architect take any responsibility for those cracks? No, he blamed the plasterers for something. So you get in some terrible, terrible situations with, with architects and builders. I think the best way, and, I, and this goes against a lot of the advice that you'll get from consumer associations to say, oh, you've got to have a proper contract, joints, contracts, you know jct and all those sort of things you've got to have it all you know cross the t's dot the i's they tell you all that stuff otherwise you'll come unstuck and in actual fact you can lead yourself into more trouble than it's worth finding a local builder who is trusted that your friends have used and is a good guy and knows what he's doing to me is the very best thing you can do and he's saying lee's saying if you are robbing want to come up and do this job we'd be pleased to see you. a bit of a slap for us from surrey to newcastle but uh thanks for the offer anyway but um finding some local guy like that would be would be my thing and, and if it's going to take you a little bit of time you've got to talk to people and they're going to be busy they're not going to be that cheap why should they be that cheap if they're good and they're busy then there's no point them doing jobs for less than they want so i'm afraid it's it's a bit of a minefield um, and it seems to me that if you're paying 10% to the architect, if you paid the builders another 10%, you might be, you might be better off. You want somebody who's flexible, you want somebody who's happy to work there, and you want somebody that uh, you can get on with, and that's a bit of a tall order, even before they put a spade in the ground, as it were. So here's a question from Chris Evans, and Chris is just about to fit a new bathroom, and he's been watching our videos on fitting bathrooms, and he said, I like the look of that elements abacus elements board so he's going to use that to waterproof the walls and everything and he said but the trouble is if he does the walls and then he does all the floor and everything else he said it's going to be a lot of boards he said so is there anything else he can use i'm presuming that he's looking for something cheaper there are other boards around obviously there are loads of other boards around and uh, one you could look at is hardy backer there aren't any insulating properties in the hardy backer board it's just a tile backing board. So you've got to think about why you're using this board, what you're trying to achieve with it. If you've got masonry walls, you can tile straight onto the masonry walls. So putting the board on is only just giving you a thin layer of insulation so that it makes the tiles a bit warmer, but there's really no need to waterproof those walls that much. I mean, you could paint a membrane on the wall and then just tile straight onto it. So that would be that would be a good way of doing it. Um, 
so you know it's a question of if he's going to build a false wall here looking at this picture if he wants to tidy up that pipe work and everything then building a false wall you can build it with a bit of elements board fairly easy job and then just use tile backer board something like hardy tile backer board on the floor because you don't need the insulating properties of it and that'll be fine so yeah there's i mean basically you know google it have a look at it go to places like wix see what they've got on the shelf and uh, and go from there but it's it's one of many options the, the thing is about tiling onto timber floors is that you really don't want to be tiling straight onto the floorboard you want something a lot of people would use a bit of plywood you know something like nine mil ply and if you're going to go for a decent plywood it's going to cost you as much as the tile backer board so you know in the end what, what are you saving you know you're going to save at best you're probably going to save 50 quid so you know if, if that's important to you then then do it with something else you know but for me i'm thinking 50 quid you know in a few weeks time do you notice that that extra bit it's always going to cost you money doing home improvements so it's up to you